Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. This is an educational channel and we try to um, shed light on some of the great theories of everything that uh, people have put out over the millennia. Uh, a lot of modern things but a lot of ancient things as well. We went uh, took a very very deep dive into the ancient Egyptian tree of life and we're taking an equally deep dive into the reciprocal system of theory from Dewey B. Larson. Eventually we're going to delve into some other things, um, creative music and quantum arithmetic, synergetic geometry, uh, Probably um, uh, Vipassana meditation and uh, probably a lot of other stuff as well. Put it, put some videos up on uh, fitness, exercise, and diet, and um, some on um, a lot of. Uh, kind of crypto um, history, ancient history, especially uh, religious history. And uh, hopefully in the year 2024, we'll get around to all those things. Uh, but we spent uh, pretty much all of 2023 working on the reciprocal system. Today is our 377th video. And uh, Mr. Larson was an engineer who lived in the 20th century. He um, had his first inklings into the reciprocal system way back around 1930 and uh, took him almost 30 years to develop his ideas to the point where he could put out his two fundamental postulates. And that was through a process of deduction kind of generalization from experience. And um, he did, so he developed his, uh, his theory through induction. And then once he really got his postulates, he took his postulates and put them through a process of deduction. If this, then that. And, um, you know, kind of the opposite direction um, from the general to the specific and formed his theoretical universe, uh, how the universe would look if my postulates were correct. And then in his books, he compared his theoretical universe, the universe that he came up with strictly from theory, without uh, regard to anything having to do with any type of observations or measurements. And um, then he uh, compared his theoretical universe with the universe of uh, the scientists, the one that they had observed and measured uh, through experiments in the laboratory and so on. Uh, they're more or less a lot of their scientific tables, you know, their charts of uh, lists of how the various elements react under certain circumstances, their melting points and their boiling points and their compressibility and their specific heats. And also the same with the astronomical bodies, the stars and galaxies, you know, their... Um, size and their periods and their um, locations and um, he compared his theoretical universe with theirs and uh, turns out he was able to uh, predict very accurately or um, that there was a lot of agreement we'll just say that there was a lot of agreement between the two and usually when there was an agreement um, the discrepancy um, was in Larson's favor. 
So that uh, gives you some kind of indication that he knew what he was talking about. And uh, other than that, he was able to make a lot of predictions about things that the scientists didn't even know about, uh, such as the existence of quasars, which is something that Larson predicted way back in about 1959, uh, the existence of quasars and many, many, many of their various qualities. And um, he was able to come up with that just from theory. Uh, a few years later, the legacy scientists began to start uh, recognizing quasars and disco discovering them. Uh, Larson was able to make a lot of predictions. So uh, he has a track record. Um, now, I'm not saying that he got everything right. But uh, he got a lot of things right. And so I believe he deserves a hearing. People should know what his theory says. But uh, unfortunately, the uh, scientists have barricaded the doors. And they're going to make sure that Mr. Larson never, uh, now he's deceased, but that him and his theory never set foot in the hallowed halls of the ivory tower. Um, and I think that was really Larson's downfall, is that he, he was attempting to uh, probably naively uh, attempting to convince these scientists, where he should have probably gone after more lay audiences who hadn't been already indoctrinated into this um, mainstream uh, scientist garbage uh, and that they would have had more of an open mind to uh, accepting his theories. Um, Dr. Bruce Perrette, one of Larson's followers, um, you know, he indicated that his, his target audience was more like a, a intelligent 13-year-olds who had never taken any science classes and therefore had not been indoctrinated yet. Uh, but they were intelligent enough to grasp the theory because the theory is simple enough to grasp. Um, the hardest part about grasping the reciprocal system is being able to unlearn all of the legacy propaganda that you've already learned. So, uh, you know, if you are a 13-year-old and you haven't started taking any science classes, you know, the reciprocal system probably sounds a lot more plausible than it does once you start learning um, the uh, party line uh, that the scientists are trying to shove down your throat. Now, the basic idea behind... Um, the uh, reciprocal system, again, is laid out in Larson's two fundamental postulates. I'm just going to go briefly over both of them, and without a whole lot of explanation, then we're going to get into the reading here. Um, first, first postulate is that the universe is composed entirely of one component, motion, existing in three dimensions, in discrete units, and with two reciprocal aspects, space and time. And the second postulate is that the universe conforms to the relations of ordinary commutative mathematics. Its primary magnitudes are absolute, and its geometry is Euclidean. Now keep in mind that Larson tweaked these postulates, especially the second one, um, several times over the course of the last 30 years of his life, changed a few of the words around. Uh, at first, instead of using the term motion, he used the term space-time. He eventually uh, began to use the term change in three dimensions instead of motion as well. Um, and... Uh, you know, so those aren't exactly set in stone, but the basic idea is that the universe is made out of motion. Motion is the relationship between space and time. Space and time, therefore, are reciprocals of one another. 
meaning that they have the same qualities exactly in as a general matter, um, but that they are inverted uh, and that space and time do not exist in and of themselves. They only exist together in motion. Motion is a fraction with space or time as the numerator and time or space as the denominator. But space and time both have multiple dimensions and so that also goes into that fraction. Um, and that the uh, space and time both come and therefore motion come only in discrete units, meaning that you have to have a minimal, there is a minimal unit of time and a minimum unit of space. If you don't have a full unit, then you don't have anything. And um, if you have exactly one unit of time in one unit of space, I mean, I'm sorry, one unit of space in one unit of time, you have the speed of light. The speed of light is what Larson calls unit speed, and he sees it as the state of rest of the universe of motion, uh, otherwise known as the uh, progression of the natural reference system, or the uh, reference datum, or the zero point origin, ether, um, the null point, uh, all of those things, uh, it is the midpoint of this universe, meaning that half of the universe is moving faster than the speed of light, uh, the cosmic sector, as well as the material sector, which is the sector moving slower than the speed of light. Um, and uh, Larson's kind of motion is not really the kind of motion that you're accustomed to, uh, especially if you're a scientist, that vectorial motion. Larson is referring to something more general called a scalar motion. Scalar motion is a motion that has a magnitude, but it has no specific direction, which you can envision using a balloon with dots on it. If you blow up the balloon, all of the dots are moving away from each other, um, but they are not moving in any specific direction. Every dot is moving away from every other dot, and... Um, that's what you call a scalar motion. That's also reflected in time. Time is always getting later and later and later and later. And, uh, but it's not getting later in any specific direction. And uh, so we see time as a scalar progression. We see space as a three-dimensional uh, stationary thing. But if we crossed the speed of light boundary into the cosmic sector, we would see time as a three-dimensional stationary, and we would see space as progressing. The space would always be getting uh, further and farther and farther apart, uh, like um, two locations on the surface of an expanding balloon. Okay, now what we are Looking at today is the third installment on this article that is called The New Science of the 21st Century, written by Dewey B. Larson, or actually this is a paper that he gave back in 1978, and we're going to try to wrap this up today if possible. Um, this section here, so if you want to uh, start at the beginning of this paper, you want to go back about two videos. And this section is called Advances in Inductive Theory. In the meantime, let us return to the question of inventive versus inductive science. While the position of the prevailing inventive science has been deteriorating, a large number of individual in advances in different physical fields have extended the solid framework of inductive theory far beyond the level at which it stood in the early 20th century. Scientific knowledge at that time was too limited to provide the necessary foundation for an inductive theory of the far out regions into which observation was beginning to penetrate. This was the reason, of course, why inventive science gained the ascendancy. A few of the essential building blocks were already in place. The discrete nature of the units of radiant energy had been demonstrated. Radioactivity had been discovered electric current had been identified as a movement of electrons, and so on. 
but an immense amount of additional information had to be accumulated. That information is now available, and the final addition to the inductive structure needed to make it able to uh, needed to make it able to deal with the entire body of current empirical knowledge has been provided by a new theoretical development. This development is the subject of my published works and those of my associates. Uh, this section is called The Missing Link. As often happens in scientific research, this theoretical advance was an unexpected result of a project aimed at a totally different objective. The project, begun a half century ago, uh, attempted to devise a way of calculating the physical properties, or at least some of them, from the chemical composition. In some respects, this is a rather unfavorable subject for un investigation. It has had a great deal of attention from previous investigators, and the most promising lines of approach have been rather thoroughly combed over. On the other hand, it is a problem for which an answer certainly exists, since the physical properties of different sub substances obviously are the results of their chemical composition. I started with the concept embodied in the periodic table of the elements. The idea that the principal properties of these elements depend on the two variables represented vertically and horizontally in the tables. The first real advance that I made after many false starts was a recognition of the fact that one of those variables assumed both positive and negative values, whereas the other was always positive. Then, after much additional time and effort had been applied, it became evident that there were three of these principal variables rather than only two. While these efforts to establish the form of the mathematical relations were underway, I was also struggling toward an understanding of the meaning of the mathematics. A tie-in to physical reality was necessary if the results were to be conceptually correct. Here again, my first efforts followed conventional lines of thought. The prevailing view was, and still is, that the differences between the properties of the chemical elements are due to variations in the number and arrangement of the subatomic particles of which these elements, atoms, are assumed to be composed. My original course of procedure was directed toward accounting for the mathematical relations on this basis. Continued lack of success forced me to consider other alternatives. One of the possibilities that I eventually visualized was that some of the variability might be due to differences in the motions of which constituent particles rather than, so, uh, rather than to differences in the atomic composition. This approach was likewise unsuccessful, but it did produce some indications that I was on the right track. These indications became stronger when I placed more emphasis on motions and less on composition. Eventually, the idea that some of the variability might be due to differences in the motions was discarded and it was substituted by the idea that such differences are responsible for all of the variations. The identity of entity X. This was the first really radical conceptual jump in the development of my thought, and it had some significant consequences. When the variability was ascribed entirely to differences in the motion, the existence of only three major variables made it quite clear that the motions must be motions of the atom rather than motions of many atomic constituents. Then, since the inherent motion of the atom is almost certainly rotation, the number three naturally suggested rotations around the three perpendicular axes. The magnitudes of the three major variables could then be identified with the speeds of the three rotations. On this basis, the entity X of which atoms of matter are composed, according to the conclusions reached earlier, is the motion 
and the atom is simply a combination of motions. The concept of an atom composed of subatomic particles now had to be discarded. With this understanding of the general nature of, atomic of the atomic structure, the stage was set for the final inductive step of the original proje project. Among the mathematical expressions that I had derived during the 20 years or more that I had already been working on the project were some interesting expressions relating to certain physical properties of the elements directly to their atomic numbers. What I now had to do was to put these expressions in terms of motions. This was another long and often frustrating task. But after several more years in which I examined every possibility that I could think of, it finally dawned on me that one of the most intriguing of the mathematical expressions that I had formulated, one that related the interatomic distances of the elements in the solid state to their atomic numbers, could be very easily explained if there were a general reciprocal relation between space and time. If any of you who are encountering this idea for the first time find it rather weird, I can understand your reaction. It struck me that way too. My first impression was that the idea of the reciprocal of space was about as plausible as the reciprocal of a soft-boiled egg. But when I looked when I took a closer look at this concept, I could see that it was not so unreasonable at all. The only relation between space and time of which we have any definite knowledge is motion. And in motion, space and time are reciprocal, reciprocally related. So I examined further the consequences of such a relation. I found, much to my surprise, that it led directly two simple and logical solutions for at least half a dozen long-standing problems of physical science. And just parenthetically, you can see the uh, reciprocal relation uh, between space and time in motion. All you just look at uh, speed. Um, the car is moving 10 miles an hour. If you double the speed, you can say the car is now moving 20 miles an hour. But you can also say that the car is now moving 10 miles per half hour. You can either double the space or you can halve the time. That is a reciprocal relation. Okay, anyone who has ever done research work will understand that this is the kind of a breakthrough that we visualize in our most rosy dreams. And of course, it called for the initiation of a full-scale investigation to see just how far this clarification of the physical picture would extend. By the time of my first publication in 1959, I had been able to formulate a set of postulates incorporating the reciprocal concept. I could show that the principal features of the major subdivisions of physical science could be obtained by pure deduction from these postulates without the aid of any supplementary assumptions or any information from experience. In the years since the initial publication, scientists in all parts of the world have joined in the effort. The scope of the deductive system has been increased to the point where we can predict that it will ultimately achieve the objective that Newtonian science once envisioned. It will encompass the entire physical universe. And I think that uh, Larson even understates that in that um, not only did it encompass the entire physical universe, but it, uh, in his last book, Beyond Space and Time, he goes beyond the physical universe to the metaphysical universe and covers subjects such as life, and mind and ethics. And so, um, you know, here back in 1978, uh, when he's giving this talk, he, might, he may not have recognized the full um, 
the full implications of his theory because uh, he says it will encompass the entire physical universe. Not only that, but even more important, it goes beyond into the metaphysical universe as well. Um, Larson died in 1990, and so... Uh, and his book, his book Beyond Space and Time on Metaphysics wasn't published until five years after his death. And so um, I'm not really sure when he started working on that book, when he had his first ideas that, hey, I can also extend this theory into metaphysical areas. And he extended the theory into economical areas too, like the so-called social sciences. We're going to look at his book that is called The Road to Permanent Prosperity, um, eventually as well in this study. Um, now, I, uh, I was mistaken thinking that we were going to get through this paper today. Um, I think we're going to have to stop right here, and then we'll have another chunk uh, to get through tomorrow. Uh, these are pretty long pages, and I guess I underestimated the length, but uh, that'll be just fine. We can uh, wrap this up tomorrow and uh, then move on. But, um, you know, interesting to hear Larson speak about, you know, his process of uh, going through and getting to the reciprocal system and how he you know, started out with much more modest uh, aspirations, but then realized that he had uh, gotten into something that was very uh, central and um, fundamental. And it caused him to be motivated to put a full-scale investigation into it. You know, that that just kind of shows how today people today just are more cowards you know that a, a lot of times people today if they were able to recognize that they're sitting on something that that's important and that valuable you know a lot of times they don't answer the call and they just shove it under the rug and pretend it doesn't exist and then um, you know, because it disrupts their life. It makes their life, their current life, their status quo more difficult. And so, you know, even when they do stumble across something that's fundamentally important, they don't pursue it because, you know, well, I got a, you know, I, I have a career to follow. Um, I don't want to be humiliated. And that, I mean, that is what happens. You, you get humiliated. You know, the powers that be um, target you and they weaponize everything that they ha have to ruin you. You know, make sure that you don't make a living. Make sure that you don't, um, you know, um, in some cases they even mess with your own family. So, you know, when that happens, you're probably on the right track. Um, and I know that it does take some type of courage to uh, go further in this, but I just see that the people of today, um, uh, at least a lot of people of today are, are, are not answering those calls and that instead they are cowering and, uh, settling and pretending that everything is just okay. So, um, one of the many reasons why Mr. Larson is one of my heroes, because he answered the call and he uh, never got paid. He never got famous, but he did it anyway. Um, and he will, you know, get famous eventually, but it might be another hundred years or something, whatever. Uh, hopefully we'll wake up a little bit more quickly than that. All right, well, um, tune in tomorrow when we will finish up this paper. And uh, thanks for tuning in today. Have a great night.